Pinkerton's Ghosts is a horror anthology podcast by Superversive Radio, with no affiliation with any detective agency, person, real or imagined, or the dark forces of Outre Terre. It is not intended for children. Jack Morrow here. I listened to Eugene's mission report. Good job. Room for improvement. I'll go over more of my inner monologue during the mission, rather than just the facts. This should smooth things out for your next real mission. I was investigating the disappearances from Gerald, Missouri. Gerald isn't much of a place. It's a small town... 1,300 people spaced out along a once great railway line and named after a family of settlers. Once a one-horse town, the freight business treated the town well and still has a thumbprint on the local hub. Now, five people out of a thousand may not seem like a big number, but it counts for a small town like that. Even if they were in the running for the top town drunk, it still mattered a lot. The kicker? A FBI agent from out of town disappeared as well. There were the usual rumblings of a curse, or a monster, or a few other mm, who-knows-what. I guess Days didn't want to touch this one after that. I always did figure that most government agencies hated each other. FBI stomped on something Days was getting in on, and, well, maybe Agent Jackass should have believed in ghosts. My investigation followed the FBI agent. A bit of a bluff and a false ID got a copy of her notes from a very confused greenhorn looking for his superior. He and I chatted a bit. He tried to keep making a joke about his name, which was also Gerald. I didn't bite. Humor often outs fakes and fake IDs. You become a friend, and then you reveal something that turns them into an enemy. I gave him the fake name of McCaffrey. I did my due diligence with her notes. Agent Jimenez had worked with a day's task force to cover up something in St. Louis, a factory explosion of some kind. She had come away with a deep hatred for their methods. Never hate methods that keep you alive. I kept a blank face over the whole conversation, playing up my role. Gerald didn't know much. He didn't understand. Neither he nor Agent Jimenez. They had not been, uh, baptized by the Terre. They weren't aware of the spiritual war. Neither had taken a ticket. They might have even still believed in what they were doing. Maybe they all did. I advised the Greenhorn that he'd see more things like this, and he should keep his mouth shut. He might live longer. He didn't get it, and I wasn't about to tell him I was the source of the explosion in St. Louis. See the Long Pig's mission. I told him we'd investigate tomorrow. I left that night instead. It's best to misdirect those who only have vague ideas. I wanted Gerald, town and man, to be pushed back into the mundane world. A lie that ensures the mission and saves more lives is acceptable. It's the same as a military misdirection. To the matter at hand. Agent Jimenez had been following a trail that led her to an abandoned warehouse outside of town. It had its fair share of them. Thankfully, Jimenez had been a stickler for noting down her investigative procedures. The warehouse in question was next to a mortuary. The moon was not visible above. I didn't care for the cloud cover or the darkness. I knew that the mortuary and warehouse were abandoned, but I didn't know what was in there. As much as it pained me, burning it down without knowing the target was a bad idea. For one, I could be aiding its life cycle. For another, 
some of its victims could still be alive or in some sort of trap. I didn't like how close the mortuary was to the hulking waste of commercial property. Surely the sign said closed, but I didn't trust it. There was enough juice running through it that the security lights were on, and secondly, Gerald was the exact type of town that things like a generator running could slip through the cracks. Townies believe their world won't change. Therefore, everything is as it should be. It's neither good nor wrong, but complacency kills every time. Details determining threats or non-threats are everywhere. The more information you take in and classify, the easier it is to manage the threats against you. Details determining non-threats or threats are everywhere. The more information you take in and classify, the easier it is to manage the threats against you. Humans are not naturally paranoid. It must be trained. Train it to defend your body, not your ego. I put it out of my mind. As much as I champion the virtues of properly applied paranoia in this job, it can't be acted on without a good reason. This is for those newbies in the back who haven't gotten their feet wet yet. There's a basic rule for any paranormal Pinkerton. If a vampire goes into a basement and then you hear him go, What a great heartant. I'm going to sleep for a week. And he is not, obviously, trying to lure you in. You can come back in around noon or so and stake him without having much trouble. You should look out for traps, but unless he has some guards, it's pretty easy to take care of it then and there. Or if a werewolf is the mayor of a small town. Killing the beloved dog-rescuing mayor of a small town during their Founder's Day parade is a bad idea. Kill him when transformed, if possible. Werewolves are fairly uh, civilized these days. It won't be hard to taunt a barely sane werewolf into attacking you. If some townsfolk see him as a raging beast, it's easier to explain why it had to be done, and have them willingly be mind-wiped by whatever amnesia-slinging monkeys Daze sends in. That goth chick might not be a witch, no matter how deep into astrology she is. Is she being led by demons by any of her three nose rings? Yes. That does not mean she has magical powers. If you think there's more than the usual BS, follow her into the forest and destroy her shrine, if she even has one. Don't go out with her. Don't think it's cool you finally get to date a goth. Replace goth with whatever particular monster, human or whatever you please, or Medusa's. Eugene. Choose your time to strike. If you must kill, kill with the least witnesses or the most justification. And, finally, don't be deceived and think a poseur is the real deal. Sometimes red flags are just red flags, not a sign of something trafficking in the outre-terre. Sometimes a warehouse is just a particularly vicious homeless person's camp. And sometimes the security alarms being on just means that the security alarms are on. You can't burn it down just because. Hindsight? Yeah, I should have burned down the warehouse and the mortuary too. But I did not know for sure until I went in. Hindsight isn't a justification for anything. Every circumstance is its own unique situation. The next time I have to enter a warehouse like this, I will enter it just like I did last night, so I know what's in there, and that I can make sure it's dead when I leave. That's the key, really. The thing you don't kill today will hunt you down and try to kill you tomorrow. The warehouse was silent. I expected that. It was dark. I expected that, too. My first step echoed in the dark halls of the office section. I mean, it echoed like a bell from a church steeple. It was loud. I stopped in my tracks. There was no sound but the receding tap of my booted toe on concrete. I took a lug nut out of my pocket and dropped it. 
It did not make a sound when it hit the ground. It rolled a little bit and then disappeared into the thick shadows. I kept a sharp eye out and flashed my flashlight at any likely and unlikely point whatever was causing this could come from. I tapped on the ground. Like my step, each of the three taps rang out loud and heavy. The tap of my shoes was one thing. My fingers sounded like gunfire. I ran to the nearby door to the locker rooms. The footsteps got louder and louder with every step. Nothing came through the doors. Nothing was on the ceiling. I could hear nothing except my footsteps. I could not hear my own breathing or when I checked my 1887 shotgun for brimstone rounds or when I rotated the doorknob. Snapping my fingers made noise. The conclusion came to me quickly, almost faster than I'm dictating now. Something was suppressing the sound of everything but what would reveal my location. The doorknobs and other things I tried didn't make a sound because it was non-flesh on non-flesh. It was time to use this to my advantage. If one is stuck in a situation with one big tell to your location making you vulnerable, overload that system. I flitted from placing my back against concrete columns to using my flashlight to cover likely attack vectors. I stomped loudly and threw my voice in multiple directions. Hello? I'm here from the Fly-By-Night Cleaning Company. I am here to talk about our contract, Fly-By-Night. We always work through the night. Ha <laughs> ha. We are only night janitors. You remember Dr. McNinja? <laughs> how, how he doesn't hire night janitors? He wouldn't have had a problem if he had hired us. Ha <laughs> ha. My voice echoed up and down the empty halls and mostly mothballed machinery. The charade was dumb, but I wasn't attacked. Instead, something black skittered just out of sight. I could tell something was watching me. Any time I passed my flashlight's beam over a likely location, I saw the shadows retreat much slower than at the speed of light. I would light up a corner and the shadows would melt away in seconds. It did not burn. It dissolved. Weight that I had not consciously thought of before left my shoulders. Either the monster had left and the feelings of being watched were common paranoia, or the monster had fed too recently to want an attack. Not only that, there were other things to consider as well. Maybe it needed an element of surprise, or it needed me to be in despair, or it needed me to curse and to let it in. I don't know. I found a ground-level alcove filled with the shadow stuff. I put my hand out and felt nothing. The whole mass shuddered as my gloved hand tore through it. It had no weight, no substance, but reacted to force and light. I snapped around in time to see something scurry away from my light. I missed its body, but I caught its thin legs dancing on the melting shadows. Parts of it melted away with the light. There was a hiss. The thing hurt. It could be burned out with the light. I could hear it now. The hissing helped me locate it. I could pick out just the barest taps of its claws and the scrape of its body. I had my shotgun out trying to get a bead on it. Its frantic movements reminded me of a spider. I hate spiders. Well, I hate ultra tear spiders. I do not own spiders, even if I do encourage them to eat pests on my properties. I had caught a glimpse of it. I needed more. I needed a clear shot. This place was probably insured. I could burn it to the ground and it would even be profitable for the owners if their insurance was good for it. McCaffrey, are, are you there? I saw your car. Gerald had stumbled onto the location. I felt a rumbling in the air. The shadow spider made a beeline for him. Gerald, you idiot, get out of here. You're in danger. I can't let you go in, McCaffrey. I let Jimenez go out alone. Idealistic young idiot. I ran for his voice. He had entered where I had. I shouted again. You can't see them, you... Gerald screamed. Something hissed over my head and I ducked. The scream stretched out long minutes. Occasionally a flash burned away the shadows. I did not hear the gunfire, but I felt the bullets passed by. Only the air marked how close I had been to being shot. I slammed my back to a concrete wall besides the entrance. 
I waited. The screams ended, but I knew what that meant. I turned to the exit flashlight at the ready. I saw Gerald standing still. His back held itself straight up and down. His gun pointed into the air, the finger pulling the trigger uselessly. His flesh bulged in the pale imitation of Gerald. Red lines along his flesh dripped with blood. His eyes and face looked untouched, but the eyes did not dilate as the light hit them. His skin shifted as black spider legs pinched the cuts together. Sometimes, it's not worth seeing if somebody can be saved. I brought my shotgun up and gave Gerald a face full of brimstone. He screeched and ran at me. I pumped round after round into him. He was dead, or would have been dead, and I had killed whatever had killed him. The fire spread under his skin. Black legs flailed from the cuts in his back, trying to pull away. I counted my lucky stars. I had my flashlight. I burned away with the firelight, could not reach. I stood over it until nothing else moved. I hate the smell of burning flesh, but you get used to it. Sometimes you have to bear it just to make sure the job is done. I'd come back for Gerald's corpse after I was sure there weren't any other spiders. I'd call into a special line reserved by days for situations like this, and they'd take care of it. Sometimes people just go to the wrong place at the wrong time. It may seem callous of me, but there were six bodies to find in the area. The job wasn't over until I could find the other victims, or at least confirm their deaths and set fire to the final resting place. I did not know how these things grow and reproduce. Therefore, I needed to burn out the nest to destroy them. When something like this happens to a third party, you can make sure it happens to others. A collapsed wall led me to a dusty basement. I couldn't tell how old it was, but it led to an open door and a rough cave system beyond. It was thick with shadow spider silk. I could smell rotten flesh. I was close. I took a turn into the mortuary basement. This door was a crumbled concrete wall. The outre-terre causes rot, physical or spiritual. It'll rot out a specific section, the right section, to cause the most damage. Concrete foundations don't rot like this. This room was about as thick in the shadow spider silk as the warehouse had been, if not more so. The security didn't have motion sensors, I guessed. I kept low anyway, moving my flashlight on the many nukes and crannies this place had. It was an emptied-out office space. The desks were emptied out, a few CRTs squatted on top. I passed through quickly. There was a particularly thick line of silk that led out into the hall. Following it, I went into one of the corpse preparation rooms. In this place, the tools were laid out as if waiting for the doctor to come back. Jars of strange, pungent liquids lined the walls. There were some boxes at the door full of equipment. The dates were about 13 years old. The paranormal Pinkertons went through their own bad stint during the 08 recession, too. Nothing supernatural there. A female voice croaked behind me. My flashlight burned away enough silk to reveal the body of Agent Jimenez collapsed against the wall. She waved in a slow, deliberate motion. Her hand barely kept itself up against the wall. Her other hand was gone or invisible. I couldn't see black on black among all the shadow spider silk. I brought my shotgun to bear. I fired, but she was pulled to the side. The phosphorus hit something and roared into flames that licked the ceiling. A reminder for all the paranormal Pinkertons out there. Hospitals, mortuaries, and any other medical facility can be trusted to be full of arson-friendly liquids. If all else fails and there won't be massive collateral damage, burn it to the ground and run for it. Kill the monsters trying to crawl out. The Jimenez thing screamed. She scrambled at me, alternating her legs and arms up and down, close to the ground. It was like a child crawling, except with the body flat on the floor. I had seen some vampires crawl like this before. I opened fire on her body as it lay prone on the ground. She leaped, but I blew off her foot. The thing screeched again. 
I shot Agent Jimenez in the air. The spread hit her cheek and shoulders, throwing her away from me. I pumped another round into her as she hit the wall near the flame. I reloaded my shotgun. The shadows were melting away in the firelight. Near to where Jimenez burned, a hand jutted from the closet. I did not feel the need to investigate further. The hand was rotted and very dead. I blasted some rounds into the wood paneling in the closet, setting some of it alight. I returned to the cave and rolled some flares into any holes I found, just in case the light kept those things away. The warehouse proved harder to burn, but the offices had carpeting, and some of the lubricants and other factory pieces were very flammable. I spread what I could before I lit it up. I might have seen one body, and the sign said that this was a larder, but with a thing like this, be thorough. A thorough job will prevent death in the future. Overall, I'm going to recommend this one to Days for follow-up. I'm going to have to write a hell of a sanitized document for them. I can only help they can sanitize that for their fellow federales. We'll have to see. I hope this helps, Eugene. Great work with the Medusa. I'll reinforce the lesson. Put a few more bullets into the body. You can never be too sure. We can spare ammo, but we can't spare paranormal Pinkertons. Besides that, there's no governing body that covers cruel and unusual methods for monster hunting. Do what needs to be done. Make evil pay. Jack Morrow out. Pinkerton's Ghosts is a podcast distributed by Superversive Radio. A license under an attribution non-commercial, share-alike international license. This episode was written by Ben Wheeler and is performed by the same. Ben Wheeler edits, directs, produces, and herds cats. Ken Dickerson performs our audio editing. Visit us on Facebook, read articles on superversivesf.com, or listen to us on unauthorized Acast iTunes, or Spotify. Contact us through Twitter at at Pinkerton's Ghosts, email us at Pinkerton's Ghosts at gmail.com, or send us noble messenger possums with messages strapped to their backs. Don't worry, they know how to find us. Thank you for listening, and good luck.